for this moment. And then he put Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown together for their moment. So funny. One of the benefits of living in Boston is being exposed to five great sports teams with many championships and legacy, and there are accompanying parades every time that each one of these teams wins a championship. Of course, the celebration invariably involves dealing with the occasional fanfare that takes it to the extreme. But for the most part, it's about celebrating the victory, the teams, and the superstars. So I got a chance to take a look at this parade today but speaking of superstars, we have a couple of superstar and Adana guests for you guys today for the latest articles of Significance series, where we reviewed some of the recent endodontic literature. Dr. Brooks Bletcher and Rebecca Prylas are board certified endodontists and authors of the endodontic board review and a newly published textbook of clinical endodontics. They practice full-time in partnership in the Upper Valley Endodontics in White River Junction, Vermont, and teach in the postgraduate endodontic programs at both Harvard and Tufts universities. Now, Dr. Mona Mishkin, whom you probably know from the previous video in the series we've done on these articles of significance, is a local restorative dentist here in Boston with a keen interest in endodontics. Mona has selected the four articles that we're going to be talking about today in this session. I will break these uh, four articles into four separate videos for the sake of brevity so that they don't become very long videos. Okay, so if you're ready, let's take a look at these articles. Okay, ready? Go on. So, thank you, first of all, for joining me. Thank you. And awesome, yeah, thank you. And uh, without further ado, Mona, let's go ahead and uh, get into the articles. Okay. So, um, the first article is a study by Sabedi and colleagues. Um, it's titled Outcome of Contemporary Non-Surgical Endodontic Retreatment, a Systematic Review of Randomized Controlled Trials and Cohort Studies. This study aimed to investigate the outcomes and prognostic factors associated with contemporary non-surgical endo retreatment. 29 studies from 1988 to 2022 with a minimum sample size of 30 and average follow-up of at least two years were included. This review found that periapical healing rates were between 79 to 88 percent and success rates were between 78 to 86 percent depending on the criteria used. It also found that having smaller or no preoperative lesions, adequate root filling length, and extended follow-up significantly improved retreatment outcomes in meta-regression analysis. So the success rates for non-surgical endo retreatment sites in the study showed an increase in favorable outcomes spanning the 2000s, uh, 2010s, and 2020s, um, which is promising and shows forward progress in our field. Are there any specific advancements that you think are most responsible for this improvement in our retreatment rates? It's a great question and something we were talking about on our drive down here. You know, both access to cone beams and microscopes in terms of technology that we have at our disposal can certainly enhance outcomes uh, for these procedures. Similarly, our instrumentation techniques have gotten a lot more conservative, likely reducing the likelihood of vertical root fractures in these teeth. Yeah, I think I can add things like microscopes, things like electronic apex locators, ultrasonics, all of these are more ubiquitous in our field um, at this point in time. And the fact that we're seeing um, improving trends in prognosis shows that perhaps what we're doing is working. I guess in, for my two cents, I, we got to go back into what are the reasons for success and how could that potentially have been fulfilled better. Obviously, we have a better understanding of this thing and the, the, the idea of using better irrigation and disinfection are important keys. But as far as I'm concerned, the number one rule for success is always your diagnosis, treatment planning and case selection. And I feel like all of the technology that Brooke and Rebecca just mentioned in terms of the microscope, CBCTs, and so on, have helped improve our diagnostics and therefore our case selection. So I feel like whereas before we used to do endo as a panacea for all necrotic or problematic teeth, we now have a better uh, idea of what kind of teeth should be treated, which ones should be extracted. And perhaps that has been also a factor for improving success rate. Yeah. Absolutely, that's a great point. Related to that point, I'm, I thought this was a very relevant um, paper as we you know, often find ourselves in the situation where primary endodontic treatment has um, failed and we're trying to decide, to do, uh, decide what to do next. Um, this paper discusses a variety of preoperative factors, some of which were not included, such as pain level, uh, presence of swelling, tooth mobility, 
Can you maybe elaborate or share some of your preoperative considerations when deciding whether non-surgical retreatment is appropriate? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think we generally speaking um, trend towards non-surgical because it's less invasive as long as there's things like um, restorative considerations are kind of moving in that favor. So if we have, say, a really well-restored tooth with um, maybe large crown and bridge structures on there, posts present, things that we're going to compromise the health of the tooth um, and having to remove, we're trending towards surgery versus if we have an accessible space. So we like to think about with non-surgical retreatments, um, like the deconstruction of the tooth, kind of breaking down, getting back into those spaces. We know that our outcomes for retreatments are gonna be better if there's something that we can sort of fix from other literature. And being able to access those spaces is really what matters. So if we're gonna have hindrances in accessing those spaces, whether it's restorative, whether it's that there's prior instrumentation errors, we tend to go towards surgery versus if there's things that we look at and say, you know, hey, this is something that I can get into those spaces, I'm gonna do a really good job of correcting those things with uh, non-surgical, then that's the avenue that we're gonna take. Yeah, I mean, looking at the endodontics prognosis literature, it's really clear when we're talking about non-surgical retreatment, going back to many publications, the Toronto study included, when you can find and fix the reason why treatment was unsuccessful in the first place. Non-surgical retreatment is likely to have a very positive outcome, and those outcomes have improved with modern instrumentation, going back to kind of Jennifer Ha's paper. So for us, you know, if I look at a cone beam during my diagnosis and treatment planning, to Ollie's point, um, if there's untreated anatomy, I know that that's something that I can address well um, versus, you know, an unretrievable post, et cetera, where surgery may be a better treatment option. Um, I but having an idea of the etiology in the first place so that we can appropriately treatment plan um, is key to kind of our approach in clinical practice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think those the factors that both of you explained are critical factors for, for that better understanding of the periodontal health and biomechanics of the tooth that's remaining is obviously a key factor for these types of treatment planning selections. So you just have to, I think uh, the reason we are seeing also an improvement is that these factors are becoming clearer and clearer over time. Even though, I mean, these have been really established back in the 50s and 60s, but it's just the knowledge is now more widespread so that people are now better able to make these kind of distinctions. And as you know, this triage between surgery versus non-surgical is, is a critical thing and the factors involved that we have now more recently understood in terms of some of the studies that have been done at, at Penn and so on in terms of classifying these cases are helpful in terms of knowing where can you get better outcomes with surgery, where non-surgical retreatment would be the better option. So as a general dentist, I'll often come across small periapical radiolucencies on previously root canal treated teeth that are asymptomatic. And I'll often send a photo of these x-rays to one of my you know, endo colleagues who will you know, recommend either to keep the tooth on like a monitor or on watch or to send it to her for treatment. Are there any key radiographic characteristics to look for to help me uh, differentiate between apical scarring versus endodontic pathology? Well, this is such a great question and something that Brooke and I talk a lot about. And with radiographs, context is so important. Having historical images of that tooth and seeing if this is a periapical radiolucency that's decreasing in size over time likely points toward healing pathology or scar tissue as opposed to something that's enlarging or associated with symptoms. I think radiographs are just one piece of the diagnosis that we are giving to our patients and being able to consider that in the context of both the patient's history and everything else that you're seeing is the key to differentiating active pathology versus something that perhaps is just a scar. So another thing to add to that is that sometimes the size of the lesion um, can matter. So if you look at historic pathology, um, there is some literature to say that lesions that are smaller than two millimeters in diameter are more likely to be scar tissue if you went in and biopsied versus if they were two millimeters or larger, then they're more likely to be, you know, true pathology. And, you know, this is a real life thing that comes up. I, last week, I can think of a case in the office where a patient came in and we're assessing an endo-treated tooth that was done, you know, elsewhere. The patient recently relocated to our community, seeing a new general dentist, they're screening for things send the patient over, there's a lesion, you know, on tooth number 19. And we look at it and we say, okay, this is asymptomatic. 
clinically this tooth is normal, restorations are okay, so we're not looking at coronal leakage or anything in here. Um, I wanted to do serial imaging. The lesion is smaller than two millimeters in diameter. Research says this is possibly an apical scar. Um, in my differential diagnosis, I have asymptomatic apical periodontitis. And so I tell the patient this and I say, come back in six months and I'm gonna do another image of this area. You know, yes, radiographs are exposing patients, but it's much less invasive than exposing the patient to, you know, a retreatment, uh, non-surgically, surgically, or an extraction, you know, which is something else um, entirely. And, you know, going back to the Sabeti article, sometimes pathology takes a long time to heal. And it's, uh, you know, looking at this article, they're talking about that four-year threshold where, you know, if we, they're talking about retreatment specifically, but this I think can be extrapolated and applied to initial treatments as well. That, you know, just because you see a periapical radiolucency doesn't mean we know what the biology of that is. And so some lesions do take longer to heal, especially when we're using comb beams to assess things, pathology is gonna look bigger. And, you know, seeing a trend towards improvement um, or stability and a lack of symptoms over time means that monitoring is a perfectly reasonable approach um, with that patient getting the caveat and the you know, informed consent that if things change, if they develop symptoms, if pathology is enlarging, or if there's you know, other things happening with this tooth, we may change you know, directions. But that active monitoring is key. I don't wanna just send a patient off into the ethers and say, you know, you're fine, don't worry about it. I want to see that patient again. Yeah, I think both of these are excellent and critical factors to keep in mind. And I think to just going to maybe add a little bit to it is that you have to keep in mind a radiograph is nothing more than decalcification of bone. So it's not necessarily indicative of pathology. It just means that there's no calcium in there. So not only that, it's also a moment in time. It's just a still image, just like a picture you take, right? You don't know what happened before or after. So what you have to do is the critical part is uh, follow-up, is to see what's going on. Getting access to historical information is another important fact because it could be a healing lesion. You never know. It could be getting smaller. The four-year factor that Sabati and so on says is true, but I think it's Strindberg and other people have found that it could be up to seven years in some people. Depends on the rate of healing of an individual, right? And some people are different. And anatomically, if the root is exposed, that may not never heal in the same way. You're not going to get cortical bone. You have to see what a radiograph is. It's just the demineralization of cortical bone. I think, you know, considering that, and also at our school, our diagnostic for treatment planning uh, factors are at least having t at least two signs, two clinical signs. The radiograph could be one, but that's never enough to initiate treatment. You need to combine that as one piece of the puzzle with something else, and that could possibly be a percussion sensitivity, uh, history of pain recently in the area, uh, I don't know, uh, pal palpation sensitivity, any of that stuff, uh, but not just ever the radiograph alone. Because when you see the radiograph alone, you know, we have a saying that our dean used to say uh, at our school, we don't treat radiographs, we treat people. And um, I feel like that that's what we got to do is, you know, is the, the, we always have a follow up. And the key is communication and explanation to our patients so that they can be a part of their own treatment and be responsible for some of that. We can just let them know what's important, not to just treat every radiographic lesion, but to really understand pathology, etiology, as you guys mentioned, and uh, what would be the best course of action. Thank you. It was really helpful and thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps more info than you wanted. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so let me ask you guys a question as well. Uh, this this um, whole idea of judging success by the radiograph in a way, as it's done in most of these studies, uh, leads to two questions. As we just mentioned, radiographs are just the point in time. How accurate do you think our success criteria are currently and how relevant they are clinically? And uh, then lastly, we can build on that and say, why is it that teeth with the pre-existing radiolucency usually tend to have a lower success rate? So Rebecca, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So it, to kind of your second question here, why do teeth with pre-existing radiolucencies have a poor prognosis, it's because we're dealing with more biology than just the patient themselves. This is beyond an inflammatory condition. We now have a community, a biofilm that has moved in and caused pathology to develop. And 
our means of dealing with that pathology are limited. You know, during non-surgical treatment, we can clean and disinfect the inside of the root canal space, but we're not dealing with the you know, biofilms that are outside of the apex. And it becomes a question of a patient's ability to heal um, and their immune system and how well that they can kind of respond to that treatment and if we've eradicated bacteria to an extent that they are capable of overcoming that challenge. And to get back to your first question, which was about you know radiographic criteria for success, I think what we're learning in the prognosis literature, particularly the studies that are looking at cone beam outcomes, is that judging things by radiographs alone is perhaps a inat inadequate means to assess healing and failure. Because we know, going back to studies from Patel and others, we're missing 30% plus of lesions in the maxilla with periapicals alone. So very likely a lot of these teeth that were judged as healed historically may have evidence of decalcification at the apex. And so I do think we need to consider everything in context when we're looking at outcomes in endodontics. And that's something we haven't done historically. And, and just to add to that, I mean, this kind of brings the question up of clinician-centered versus patient-centered outcomes. And, you know, in moving towards patient-centered outcomes, we're not treating a radiograph. We're treating a patient. And a patient may be perfectly fine living their lives without symptoms with a radiographic lesion there. You know, we're missing so much, so we may simply not know about a lot of these, you know, supposed pathologies that are there. Um, once we know about them, perhaps we should monitor them, but that doesn't necessarily mean we need to be so interventionist. For, for sure. I mean, as you know, goes back to what we were talking about, the importance of recall, follow-up, and the continuity of care, which is something that is oftentimes missing in our lexicon. We tend to just kind of do the root canal, send the patient over, and like, you know, see you later. But it's so important to have that kind of a follow-up uh, routine. But I think it's also in interesting to kind of bring up the concept of, you know, using peripheral radiographs as a success criteria, as you mentioned, uh, to Patel's bringing up to our attention the fact that that's not adequate, perhaps, in terms of seeing healing. But, but then what really should be healing? And that, I think, is a whole bigger question, right? Because you could, you could have PA, CBCT, then you can get down to, you know, histology and then even molecular component part of it. I think that patient center outcomes is basically where you conclude would be the ultimate thing because it's just one extra molecule of inflammatory cells at the apex too much. Right. So we tolerate, tolerate that right. periodontally. Right. So can we tolerate that endodontically? And I don't think that is something that's been answered. Absolutely, and I think that's a, probably the best way of putting it is the perio versus endo success criteria has been very different. And that almost is translated into implant therapy, which is a whole different thing. And I think that in fact, a perfect transition for a wonderful next... segue into our next article. <laughs> our next article, which is gonna be on implants. So come back for the second uh, segment after this.